Hello, and welcome to the fourth installment of our five-part series on strategies for recruiting students to the humanities. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Scott Muir, Project Director for Study the Humanities, which with generous support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, supports efforts to attract more undergraduates to the humanities. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by three letter leaders of efforts to foster community among students and encourage them to identify with the humanities and humanities disciplines. Ellen McClure, Director of the Engaged Humanities Initiative and Professor of French at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Sarah Olzowski, Program Officer at Oklahoma Humanities and former Senior Academic Counselor at the University of Oklahoma. And Leslie Wilson, Associate Dean in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Montclair State University. Thanks to all three of you for joining us. Note that you can view recordings of earlier events in the series on our YouTube channel, which you can access through the event page link just shared in the chat. In the fall, we'll host a final webinar on how you can leverage the expertise and resources developed by scholarly societies to attract more undergraduates to the humanities. Today, our focus is on strategies for fostering humanities identity and community. We plan to have plenty of time for discussion and questions from the audience following our panelists' three presentations. Please submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll be sharing some links through the chat, but please be sure to submit your questions via Q&A rather than the chat so they don't get lost. We'll try to field as many of your broader questions for the entire panel as possible. We've had an overabundance of questions at previous events in the series, so we will be collecting the questions submitted through Q&A so that our panelists can focus on the discussion at hand and provide answers to your specific questions about their individual initiatives afterwards. Look for those to be shared via a follow-up email in the next few days. Before we hear from our presenters, I'd like to take a moment to frame today's conversation in light of our research on effective recruitment models, which you can explore through the link just shared in the chat. With a while a smaller proportion of respondents to our 2019 Humanities Recruitment Survey referenced this strategy compared to curricular innovations, career pathways, and marketing efforts, those who did so emphasized it as a crucial component of initiatives that are generating enthusiasm for the humanities. By providing a community of peers, facilitating connections with faculty, and offering special experiences, these programs highlight traditional strengths of the humanities and reinforce students' commitment to studying the humanities in the face of obstacles, such as discouragement from peers and parents. The fourth chapter of our new report, Strategies for Recruiting Students to the Humanities, a comprehensive resource, organizes these approaches into six subcategories. Programs for first-year students, creating a community of scholars through cohort programs, promoting opportunities for in-depth one-off experiences, fostering inclusive community and engaging underrepresented students, strengthening and supporting community college pathways, and peer mentorship. These various initiatives all highlight and deepen opportunities for intellectual exploration in the context of a community. Their success suggests contemporary students are hungry for the kind of personally meaningful and richly interpersonal educational experiences offered in the humanities, and that humanists can successfully tap into that demand by more intentionally packaging and promoting those opportunities to students. We're excited to have three leaders with us today who are doing this important work at a high level. We hope you'll enjoy learning how Sarah, Leslie, and Ellen have worked to foster identity and community at the department level from the Dean's Office of a Large College of Humanities and Social Sciences and through a grant-funded interdisciplinary cohort program. I'll turn it over now to Leslie. Good morning to some people who might be in other parts of the country. Um, I just want to give a little background information about my university. We're 13 miles from New York City. Uh, Montclair State has seven different colleges. Our college is the largest. We have over 5,000 undergraduate and graduate students in our college. Uh, we have programs in different disciplines, anthropology, classics and general humanities, child advocacy, social work, communication, science and disorders, English, gender, sexuality, women's studies, history, jurisprudence, justice studies, um, languages and cultures, philosophy, political science and law, psychology, religion, sociology, Spanish and Latino studies and writing studies. Um, in our college, 
the strategies that we have used, and I'll try to point them out in a bullet format, is to provide new students and their parents with a broad vision of the humanities. We've used open houses as a way of showcasing faculty and how faculty can address academic and social problems. To do this, we've given junior faculty an opportunity to demonstrate the new ways of studying traditional areas. We've used student ambassadors as tour guides to sell majors to prospective students. We have a program that's called Red Hawk for a Day. It allows prospective high school students to come to campus and sit in classes. We expose students to the most innovative faculty who demonstrate humanities and creative ways. We also create new approaches to the humanities. We broaden existing disciplines based on the talents and interests of the faculty, but we highlight interdisciplinarity. We introduce several programs through our previous dean, which were medical humanities, urban humanities, and digital humanities. Medical humanities is the fastest growing major on our campus with more than 120 majors in three years. We also use existing structures to offer new approaches to the humanities. One of those was the Center for Humanities. Historically, it offers a humanities day when we invite local high school and middle school students to campus for a variety of activities. The goal is to make this program more appealing to a new generation of students and offer the classical humanities in a new light. Another approach is repackaging existing majors in ways that appeal to the job market, appeal to target audiences, reinvigorate faculty, and revitalize students currently in existing programs. I'm going to give you some examples of that. We created and now offer a fifth year program in social research and analysis, which is attached to our sociology program a graduate program and certificate in data collection and management in our sociology program, a certificate in computational linguistics in our linguistics program, and a graduate degree, which can also be a five-year degree in applied linguistics, a language business and culture for our languages, five-year BA and MBA programs for all the humanities with an MBA five years, a major in digital and public history, a major in law and society, a major in Asian languages and cultures, a program in cognitive science, which combines psychology, philosophy, and linguistics, uh, create community engagement internships, and we are proposing a program in policy studies, which hopefully will be approved in the next few days, heritage studies, which can be a combination of a lot of things, but right now we're looking at Native Americans, uh, American Humanities, which will probably focus on American studies, and then a program which will come out of anthropology, which is called sustainability, conservation, and consumerism. And the last thing we've looked at uh, in this area is um, stackable badges, which we hope will revolutionize majors and minors. Why and how are we doing these things? Because parents and students often look at television and social media for vocational education, despite knowing that degrees do not lead to jobs. We are proposing that our majors teach how to solve problems and that these problems are common and that the skills the students will learn are transferable. We are reinforcing traditional notions of knowledge. Students find a sense of excitement in using their majors to address social matters. We have also introduced to our current dean the idea of social entrepreneurship as a way of harnessing new media skills, academic skills, and contemporary problems in a classroom setting. We are also teaching students how to create portfolios to document their efforts and highlight their triumphs. In this process, we are creating and developing leadership and team building skills. And I'm just gonna skip to uh, the last points that I wanna make, the future. The ultimate goal of all of these efforts is to transform the humanities into a singular but interdisciplinary working discipline where knowledge is essential but can be used in a variety of ways. We hope that this will alleviate the tensions. And we know that there are tensions between what faculty want because most faculty want to continue the traditional portrayal of the humanities. But we also know that we have to focus on the job market at the same time. We hope that this can be achieved through the reworking of the undergraduate core curriculums, which everyone is struggling with, 
and creative and innovative faculty initiatives. Our college is engaged in reform committees to improve the development of curriculum that is adaptive and nimble and can immediately address problems. One example of this is that virtually everywhere and at Montclair State as well, we created courses that looked at COVID this semester and made it part of the humanities curriculum. We want to, for example, use the history major to study also other areas. History should be able to study religion, political science, anthropology, sociology, philosophy, and English to solve problems in the past, the present, and the future. And we want every student to find these fields interesting and essential. So here are our goals. We want students to see value in their studies. We want parents to see the value in what their students are learning and doing. We want employers to see the value and engage with the university by providing opportunities for students to gain quality experiences and set the stage for future full-time employment. And we want the admissions office and the vice president for enrollment management to work with our faculty at our advisors, our dean's office to advertise this vision in a more robust manner. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, Sarah. All right, thank you. Give me just a minute here to get my screen sharing started. Let's see here. Okay, is that working for everybody? We good? Awesome. Okay, so thank you so much, Scott, for having me here today. Um, my name is Sarah Olszewski, and I am the former senior academic counselor um, at a, the University of Oklahoma for the history department. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, um, I was in that position until this March, and I am currently um, a program officer at Oklahoma Humanities but I'll be speaking about the work I did uh, advising for the history department from 2016 to 2021. And all of the work that I did at OU was um, involved on just what we're talking about today, fostering humanities, identity, and community. Um, it really breaks down into telling our story and how I both built that community and then grew the community. And it really started with my role as a professional advisor. Um, I, I worked for the College of Arts and Sciences, and I advised for the history major in addition to some other majors on campus. So we had a centralized professional advising model in the College of Arts and Sciences, which means that every student in our college met with one advisor from the start of their sophomore year until graduation. All students at OU have a separate advising office for their first year, but once they move out of their first year, they move into their degree granting colleges and we have the, the one professional advisor. I brought to that uh, experience being the advisor for the history department, my previous advising experience where I was advising for the biology department at OU. And I noticed that I was starting to see a lot of students who were having conversations with me about wanting to change majors to history who were, who were biology majors or had other similar types of STEM or maybe even business majors. Um, I used a listening mindset to notice those patterns with students. And you wouldn't believe um, across the board, those conversations were almost identical um, a lot of the times. Students would say, well, I always loved history, but, and then it was, you know, my parents told me to major in something else, but I was worried about getting a job. So they had come into college majoring in something else, but they had always had and held on to this love of history. And once I started hearing all these students telling me almost the exact same thing over and over in their appointments, I began a targeted data outreach um, program where we used centralized data that was available to um, basically like a data analyst position in our college. Uh, I could work very closely with that person where he could pull very specific data about students across the university. And I basically took my hypothesis and said, you know, is this a thing? Are there a lot of students out there who are maybe struggling or unhappy in STEM and business majors who have retained this love of history? And we can identify that on their transcript by seeing how many history classes are they choosing to take, even if they are a chemistry major. You know, so if you're a chemistry major and you're choosing to take a bunch of history classes for your electives or for gen eds, that indicated a love of history. Um, so that was one set of students we targeted with this data outreach. Um, we also looked at 
students um, who uh, had AP credit for history classes because that counted towards our major and minor at OU. So they already had built in credits that would work towards that major. And if a student is taking AP classes in high school in history, that means they probably have an interest in history. Um, and also students just targeting students who already had a history minor declared and saying, hey, did you know you might only need five or six more classes to finish a second major in history? And so I would email those students um, about once a semester, we would run those reports and I would tell them who I was, what my job was and how I could help them figure out, could you change your major to history or add a major in history and still graduate on time? In addition to that targeted data outreach, I would go to history classes on campus and do a short five to 10 minute presentation on the history major because at, at OU, most of the students in history classes are not history majors. Um, most students are taking those classes for electives or gen ed credit. And so I would just do a little pitch on here's what the major is, here are the opportunities, tell them about our fabulous internship program and mention the, the, the scary information about jobs and say, you can get a job when you graduate with this major and here's the hard data from the AHA to back that up. Um, and so that combined approach was what I um, started doing in order to build that community. And the where we were at that point was over the last um, five years, like since 2012, about we had seen about a 35% decrease in history major enrollment and major enrollment. So our, we were headed downhill. And these efforts in building that community uh, stopped that decline and reversed it. And um, until 2021, when I left, we had started to see a 19% increase in declared history majors and 17% increase in declared history minors. So once I was doing all this outreach to build up that community, then it became about growing the community and letting um, other people on campus know about that community. That included um, building up our social media brand on Twitter, uh, which I ran that account. And I was, I was a former history, history major myself at OU, and I was also fit the model of one of these students who had started out majoring in something else, architecture, and then switched to history because it, it was what I had always loved. So I knew from my personal experience how to speak to those students directly and make that appeal to them that like, you probably feel a little ignored on campus, um, especially at a large R1 research university like OU, where a lot of the focus is on STEM and business majors. Humanity students can really feel lost in the shuffle. Um, they feel like they don't have a place to go. You know, there's not like one building for them to hang out in. There's not a student lounge like the business students have maybe, you know. So I started being kind of forceful about advocating that position on Twitter um, with what we are calling light snark. Um, the ability to poke fun at, you know, how history majors are a little bit nerdy, but also really smart and cool and kind of poking fun at the business majors who maybe didn't know so much about what was happening in the world, you know, um, and that really attracted students and they found it <laughs> amusing and they saw it as something they wanted to be a part of. And once I started building that up on Twitter, we kind of fed off of that by um, creating putting the history club on Twitter. So by creating a community of activists um, within your student core. So we had students who during their advising appointments with me, it was their idea. They came to me and said, we wanna start a history club. And I'll be honest, my first reaction was like, I'm not sure if that's going to go over like who's really going to be interested in that like I was very skeptical. Um, but they were very passionate because they were this type of students who were felt very strongly about what they were studying and were very interested in it and wanted to get to know other students who were doing the same thing. So the students created the history club in 2018. Um, and after I had gotten the, de the departments up and running on Twitter, then they kind of piggybacked off of that to make a history club on Twitter. And since they were the student voice of this kind of light snark brand, they could push it a little even further um, within reason. And um, because I had that centralized professional advising relationship with the students, I was able to make sure that students were running that account who were trustworthy, who they weren't gonna say something that would put the university or the department in a bad light at all. They were mature students who could handle that responsibility in a fun way. 
Um, so they were really able to build off of that work that I had already done by creating the History Club on Twitter. That really started to take off once our current, our, well, our former, she's graduated last year, um, our former president took over the account in 2019, um, Sally Johnson, and it has national followers now. There's probably, I hope there's some people on the uh, in the audience who are following the History Club on Twitter, um, but they did a lot of fun stuff with it, and they took it, and that started to get attention across campus. The student paper was writing articles about what the History Club was doing on Twitter, um, and I would start to have advising appointments or get emails from students who would say, I follow the History Club on Twitter, and I'm interested in changing my major to history, because they saw a group of students having fun with it, and these were the type of students just like myself who had always loved history, and they were, they didn't know that it could be fun and have a community at a school like OU especially. Um, the other thing, the other aspect of the History Club that really kind of made them stand apart on our campus was being intentional about inclusivity. Um, at the University of Oklahoma over the past few years, we've had a, ser a series of racist incidents um, and the students who were leaders on the History Club felt very strongly about speaking out about those events. And because we already had this community basically up and running, we had a core group of students who we could trust to get that message out to the to the university that that students who are studying history don't stand for this kind of event that they were speaking out forcefully about it. And in doing those things that also attracted more attention from the student newspaper, it attracted this, the attention of other students who were maybe had been thinking about changing their major to history, because often what I find with students when they were thinking about changing their major, you know, and becoming a part of this community, it would often be something that students would kind of um, have on the in the back of their mind for maybe a semester or two and it would take a little bit of nudging a little bit of prolonged time to get them to actually make that change and by being in intentional about inclusivity with the club it was just another way that we were opening our umbrella and, and and saying everyone is welcome here and this is a place where we can all be friends because we are all history nerds together so some additional considerations in this work um, I would, I would say, you know, consider high impact learning practices on your campus and to, if you have existing communities, tap into that. Um, consider internship programs, study abroad groups, existing and active honor societies on your campus. All of these are most likely going to be students involved with those things who are passionate about what they're doing, who care about what they're doing, and they wanna know other people who are doing what they're doing. So if you can find a way to tap into that, then you've already got a set group of students ready to go. The other crucial thing with the History Club is, in the community that we built, is knowing where the money is um, and taking advantage of funding for student organizations. Um, at a university like OU, accessing that funding is an extremely complicated and arcane process. Um, it was difficult for me to even figure out, um, and it, especially with student turnover and when students are graduating and things, it can be very difficult. But there, there, it, it's likely that there is money available on your campus for this sort of thing. You probably just have to do a lot of paperwork <laughs> to get to it. And, and that's worth it because then you can use that money to publicize and host some really cool events. Some things we did with that money included like a, um, a, a charity skating party for uh, Norman citizens for racial justice. Um, you know, so you can really get creative with how you're using that funding if you're able to access it. And it's also important to have students involved in that process because knowing how to do that paperwork and handle the money, that's a transferable useful skill for history majors to have. And uh, lastly, I would just say I really advocate just having fun with it and being able to laugh at yourself and laugh at other people <laughs> in, a, in a kind way um, is, is useful because everybody wants to have fun with what they're doing. We did a lot of fun things on Twitter and online. We had a call for memes that was very popular. Um, we did a history fight bracket on Twitter where there was Twitter polls where we we pitted different historical figures against each other in like a sweet 16 type of bracket situation. And the students would be making their case for this, this or that figure to, to win, you know. Um, and we also had student designed merchandise, which also used that brand of humor uh, to set us apart, which our, our founding president is pictured here in our first t-shirt, oh, you like history, name everything that ever happened. Because of course, that's something we all hear about, you know, once you know you, someone loves history. They ask you to tell you about something, you're like, well, I don't know about 
about that one thing. Um, so that that's the that's kind of how we uh, created and built and grew this community at the University of Oklahoma. That's all. Thanks so much, Sarah. All right, Ellen. Okay, and again, I'm going to share my screen. And all right, can everybody see my slide? Okay, fantastic. So once again, yeah, thank you to the National Humanities Alliance for all your great work on behalf of the humanities. And thank you to everybody who is here and everybody who will watch the recording. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. And I'm the director of the Mellon Funded Engaged Humanities Initiative at UIC. Um, this was a million dollar grant for the Mellon Foundation that started in 2018. Um, that'll be up for renewal in July of 2022. So we're in the third of four years. Um, here's our homepage. Uh, you can see our some of our wonderful students from one of the first year classes. I just want to walk you through um, the structure of the EHI, how it's laid out, and then I'll explain a little bit more about our students and, and UIC and also some of the recruiting successes and some of the challenges and what it's taught us about um, how to recruit students, how to best recruit students to the humanities. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful adventure and uh, really lovely. So, okay, so the overall so structure of the EHI. So we have four first year seminars and writing workshops that are combined and those have 20 students each. And for the recruiting, what's important is students who take these first year classes, uh, which range from, um, which are really wonderful opportunities for faculty to teach classes, uh, maybe outside of their department that they've always wanted to, ta uh, to teach. So we've had um, a class on food production in Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, and we've had a class on race, immigration, uh, and social justice from the uh, Japanese internment to the Muslim ban. And we had a class on Islam in Chicago and the United States, for example. We scheduled those so that um, field trips are possible in that first year. Students who successfully complete these classes and this is important for recruiting, they satisfy six credit hours of requirements with one four credit hour class. Um, so they get general education credit um, towards one of our categories, but they also satisfy English 161, which is the second semester of first year writing, if they get a B or better in the class. That is a hook. Very often students find themselves in the class because of that great deal. Um, and when we say, did you know you're in the Engaged Humanities Initiative and what is the humanities? They have no idea, but this is, they didn't want to take English 161. Um, it's sort of a package. And also um, I think you can't say enough about the opportunity for students to go out. We're in Chicago, obviously. So um, the opportunity for students to go out into the city, to go to the aquarium, to go to museum exhibits, to go to the, we have a former meat packing plant that is now an indoor organic farm that the students have gone to. Um, also guest speakers, activists from the community. Um, uh, and that's obviously slowed down a little bit during the pandemic, but uh, the guest speakers, um, have been able to zoom in and that's been wonderful to have funding for that. So that's kind of how we get them in. We've really filled those classes uh, all three years. Um, those are more or less full. Um, then we have two second year sem seminars in the fall. Um, the students start getting funded then. They're hired into the EHI. They get $1,000 during that second academic year to attend lectures and events on and off campus. And I should say on and offline now, um, including at our Institute for the Humanities. So the second year seminar is harder to recruit to. So we have 80 students in that first year. And then, we, you know, I designed a whole application process in a form because I was like, oh, we're going to have 60 students and there are only 40 slots in the second year. And we have the reverse problem, right? We really have to encourage students to sign up for the second year seminars. Why? In part because the second year seminar is a little bit what I call empty calories. Uh, it's not the second year seminar. It's a Hume second level class. It doesn't carry gen ed credit. It doesn't obviously carry credit towards a major or minor. All the students can petition for that class to count towards a major or minor. Um, if, if the class is a topics class, so it has to be a case by case basis. Um, and, uh, and we do have a wonderful system to um, get them the funding to attend events, um, which, which has actually been really lovely to sort of see them go to things outside of their comfort zone and reflect on them. We have a reflection form 
and their reflections are really wonderful. So the key is really that jump from the first year to the second year. This year, it was actually even particularly difficult. I think the pandemic has really hurt our ability to go into the classes and encourage students to continue. So that's kind of one of the weak points, and I'll talk about a little bit how we've addressed that. But just to give you an idea of the rest of the EHI, the students then um, get a summer funding after their second year. They get $3,500 uh, in the summer for archival work, internships, or study abroad to work on their research projects, which they develop with a faculty mentor. So we're hitting, I, I wrote down, I think we're hitting all but one of, of Scott's six elements of, uh, of humanities programming. Um, we can check them all off and we do have some community college outreach, but we haven't been able to work as uh, intentionally about that but that's clearly important as well. During their third year then, they work on their research project. They get another $1,000 in funding to attend events and help out the EHI and this and that. Then they get another summer funding, $3,500 is available to do another summer funding to further develop their projects um, or take them in different directions. We have some students who are switching directions right about now, um, again, with a faculty mentor. And then in the fourth year, they get another um, $1,000 in funding uh, for mentorship, for example, for younger students coming up in the program. One of my ideas listening to all of you and also just um, listening to students is, um, for example, next year I'm planning to, um, uh, we're planning to give students the opportunity to earn that thousand dollars, for example, by uh, taking over our social media, right? Or by developing uh, recruitment materials for younger students. Um, as I'll mention, they are the best ambassadors of the program. You'll see this is a lot of funding, right? So parents love, we were talking about parents, parents love the funding, right? That gets their attention immediately. Um, students actually, it doesn't make as big of a difference that I think the people, uh, you know, myself included involved with a grant thought it would. Um, the students tend to sort of say, um, it, it doesn't quite seem real. And especially they kind of, because it's a four-year program, it starts with these first-year classes, a lot of them kind of fall into the Engaged Humanities Initiative, right? They take the class because they didn't want to take English 161, or they this sounded like a good idea, or they liked the topic. Then all of a sudden, we're saying, oh, and here's $10,000. So to avoid sounding like here's $10,000 for stuffing envelopes in your basement, right? Like it just kind of doesn't compute. So we do have an application process. We instituted a second, um, second year class in the spring of the second year. So students who take that HUME 201 seminar in the fall, we now have one credit hour class in the spring where we have guest speakers, including from our centers of cultural understanding and social change, from the interdisciplinary programs, from organizations in the city, from people offering internships. We go through the NHA website. We ask them to uh, read some of the essays or browse through the projects just to get an idea of what engaged humanities can be, uh, just to get familiar with it because the humanities isn't something a lot of the students are just intimately familiar with the way that all, those of us who got PhDs in the humanities are. Um, and that's, that's been, uh, we had, we didn't lose many students actually out of the second year. And I think that was hugely helpful. And one of the things we do in that one credit hour class is we help them find a faculty mentor and we help them hone a fac uh, research project. Um, so scaffolding, I think means a lot to the students. Um, I talked to our staff uh, before this meeting and they were saying, yeah, the parents love the money and the students actually are very aware of their limitations, how much they have on their plate. A lot of our students work, a lot of our students commute. Um, I'll talk about the demographics in a minute. And, and so they're very aware of, they're, they're sort of like, are we just gonna be thrown into this or do, are we going to have help? So making that scaffolding and that support clear at the outset and part of that's part of what HUME 202 does is uh, not leave them kind of to their own devices or in the wind. In the summers for their funding, we actually have uh, check-ins every other week and drop-ins in the alternate weeks just for them to touch base, talk to each other. We have small peer groups, you know, doing a lot of that work over the summer and that takes a little bit of a load off of the faculty mentors who are all kind of trying to get their research done in the summer as well. Um, so additional aspects, we have Mellon Lectures in the Engaged Humanities, one per semester, and the Engaged Humanities Working Group, which is faculty, staff, and students to talk about different areas of the humanities. But I just want to point to our student body. So 60% of our students are Pell eligible, 38% um, of our students are first generation. So selling the humanities to our students is very much like uh, selling it to the public. Our students are the public, um, and it involves 
uh, one of the great things about the engaged and engaged humanities, of course, it's engaging with a community and really listening to communities and organizations who have been doing work and seeing how um, that how they how we can help or complement the work that's already being done. That's also true on campus, is locating the places on campus that are doing this kind of work. So once again, our Centers for Cultural Understanding and Social Change, African American Cultural Center, Latin American Cultural Center, um, they've been doing this kind of work for decades. Um, how can we work with them uh, to reach students and also um, expand the, the work they're doing or how can students use the work they're doing uh, in their own research? Uh, the interdisciplinary programs, et cetera. And I just want to also say um, our undergraduate enrollment by race and ethnicity, uh, this is fall of 2020. So you can see it's an incredibly diverse campus. So one of the things that um, I'm, let's see, and I'm going to, I think I'll stop sharing just so. Um, so one of the things um, that one of the big questions, right, is, and I, and I love the previous two presentations, which is how much to emphasize uh, career uh, readiness versus um, our students, I think, are even more receptive to making a difference in the community. And I think um, both of you showed that those two things actually aren't opposed to each other, but I think it's important to hit both aspects. Um, they want to know uh, how, how things got to where they are. They're personally impacted by a lot of the issues uh, in, uh, in our society right now. And they're, that gives them the energy and the motivation to really uh, mobilize their knowledge and their skills to, um, to improve uh, society. So some of, some of the projects that they're working on, there's a student working on biracialism and black essentialism. There's a student who worked on conceptualizing a more equitable approach in the 20th century for the environment. Um, uh, so we have environmental humanities. Uh, she concluded policy, she's a public policy major. So once again, humanities and to really stress that humanities is a wonderful complement to existing programs. She wound up concluding that policy should be made not for maintaining the status quo, but for sustaining life. And she told everybody in public policy that they should all have a humanities minor. Um, once again, the students are our best uh, ambassadors. There's a student doing, and I think you saw this work, uh, Scott, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, Labor, Civil Rights and Education. She's doing a multimodal um, teaching tool for high school teachers so they can teach about the sleeping car porters uh, in, her, in their classes, climate change and income inequality. Uh, there's a student working on housing segregation in Chicago hip hop. Uh, uh, they're fascinated by gentrification. One of the students came to me and said, I'm a, I'm a swimmer in Chicago public schools and I swam in high school. And I was fascinated by the disparities in facilities and pools. And I want to know more about that. So it's really about listening to students, sitting down with them one-on-one, -on -one, listening to what they're interested in. Um, and, um, and then uh, my the fact that I've been at UIC since 1997, I have a pretty good idea of who works on what or who does know who works on what. So connecting them with faculty members and then, then connecting them with majors and minors. So I would really just reiterate what Leslie already said in the sense of, thinking beyond the major and minor. It's, it's actually been an interesting, their projects and their mentors aren't necessarily in the departments they're majoring and minoring in. So this idea of working more with topics and working more with um, themes than major and minors and trying to accommodate that is key. And I would also say um, it would be wonderful, I, I'm just listening, uh, it would be great to have a space, we were just talking about this, a dedicated space for these students um, on campus where they can just hang out or take a nap or use the computer or talk to each other or have meetings um, and discuss their research. Because as you said, the humanities people get lost. I think Sarah's uh, um, presentation reiterates that community could be a virtual com community and that that's fine. I'll also say in the student design merch, I did suggest to the students that we needed a mascot who would be named Hugh the Manatee, even though we're not in Florida. Um, and they really enjoyed that idea. And we're, we're thinking about, you know, caps and pins and things like that. But again, making it fun, but also really meaningful and, and really stressing our students are keenly aware 
um, as I like to tell them, the, the forces out there kind of don't want you doing this research, right? Humanities research is really unpacking the human cost of policy, the human cost of, of certain historical decisions that by doing research and, and really developing these skills, they're pushing back on a lot of the things um, that are that are wrong, and 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 I think they that really resonates and gets them motivated. Um, so I'll just stop there for now. Um, thank you. Thanks, Ellen, and and thanks to all three of you uh, for these wonderful presentations. Excited to have some discussion around them and uh, around these themes that we have been overlapping and uh, and kind of talk about this work from the different levels and institutional contexts that you're working within. Um, Reminder, so I've, I've been seeing some great factual questions about these initiatives coming in. We will get those answered. We're gonna use a Google doc to do that, but we're gonna to try to focus now on some questions that might be fruitful to make those connections across these initiatives. Um, and reminder, we'd love for you to ask them. We'd love to field your questions. Uh, please use the Q&A for that. Um, and uh, rather than the chat, uh, please. And uh, one other thing before I, Throw out the first question is uh, I would love to uh, express our gratitude and appreciation for UIC, University of Oklahoma, and Montclair State University, all NHA members. So thank you all for your support. Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about parents for a minute. So parents can often be an obstacle to students identifying with the humanities. Uh, and we talked about that a little bit but they can sometimes be allies as well. Can you speak to how you have either sought to get parents on board with supporting their children and studying the humanities, directly or indirectly, uh, or alternatively, fostered solidarity to support students in the face of opposition from their parents? Sarah, you wanna take this first? Sure, so um, this was a common conversation I had with students all the time in my advising office about what their parents might think or what their parents would say if they changed their major to history. And what I found most helpful was building a collection of resources to assist students in answering that question, taking the stance of you don't have to just take my word for it. You know, you can go to the career services office on campus where we have a dedicated advisor just for arts and sciences students. So someone who is trained over there and working with students who don't have a, a, a major that leads to a clear cut career supposedly, um, and also using resources like the American Historical Association's booklet, um, Careers for History Majors, which includes a lot of testimonials from history majors and a lot of those stats and numbers that parents like to see. And um, I would just put that resource directly in their hands and say, you can take this information to your parents. Um, and you don't have to just take my word for it, you know, uh, that there is research that backs up what I'm telling you, and we have resources on this campus to assist you. And it was also important to have a conversation in those advising appointments that, you know, you can study what you love, and but if you are studying what you love, you have an additional obligation to also be intentional about working towards a career path alongside studying what you love. So it's almost like two parallel paths, like you get to have fun in your history classes. And then alongside that parallel, you need to be intentional about working towards a career as early as your sophomore or junior year, so that when you do graduate, you have an idea, you know, you're not just completely lost. And um, so it, it, you have to be intentional and you can't shy away from those types of conversations with students because it's a real concern and um, it's, it's an understandable concern. Great, thanks. Leslie or Alan, would you, either of y'all like to weigh in on this? Leslie? Um, I'll jump in. I think one of the things that we do at Montclair State is that when we have our orientations, we now have a parents only meeting. And mm -hmm. I do the parents only meeting for our college. And so I talk to the parents and I tell them that, you know, programs in our college in specifics are not related to careers and that they have to give their children a chance to develop into college students and that they have to give them a chance to grow from college students into adults and that they have to allow them to think about career choices and that we are developing programs to help them do that. I think that, you know, a long time ago, people just went to college 
we're, not, we're changing college and they have to give us time to allow us to change college to make it more reactive. But I think one thing in terms of the humanities that's important is that we're developing skills and that those skills are critical and parents have to understand what those skills are. So we have to promote those skills. And I think that if we allow parents to see those skills in action, which we do at Montclair now in open houses. So when parents come for uh, the open houses, when they bring the prospective students, we have a faculty member actually give a lecture to parents when we have parent only sections. And so they can get to see how the parents react to a faculty member teaching something. And then they can show them how those skills in that lecture relate to a job market. Excellent, thanks. Um, so Ellen, would you like to jump in before we move on? Or? I was gonna say, I don't have too much uh, else to add. I think I think skills and also specific examples of, of peers, of just concrete jobs. Um, you know, again, I'm a, a professor of French and I, I go to the, before I did this, I would go to basic language classes and give the, how do I tell my parents I'm majoring in French lecture? Um, and, and to sort of just have concrete pathways, like, okay, well, there's the Peace Corps or there's being a teaching assistant in France after you graduate or just very concrete things that just to make it real so it's not just out there. Yeah. Scott, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that someone mentioned to me yesterday, which we haven't done, but I think might be interesting, is to have alumni. Does anyone have alumni come back and talk to parents uh, to show parents how they got a job from a particular major, whether it's history or from French? Um, the History Club, we hosted a career panel every year um, where we did invite alumni from our department. So people just with a BA in history from OU, and I really worked hard to identify alumni who were in a wide range of careers, um, you know, financial sector, museum sector, you know, not just what we think of as typical history major jobs. Um, I never had the idea to invite parents to that. And I think that's an awesome idea um, because I know our students really loved, and, and it's also helpful for students to meet those alumni. You know, those are valuable professional connections for them to make to then go on and build their own career and their own network. Um, but I love the idea of inviting parents. Yeah, and same here. And and again, for us, uh, I have a feeling logistically it's intimidating, but you're making me think now we're, we're kind of working on our alumni section of our website in the French department. And a student just to be able to show a website to people or have little videos from alumni um, can also fill the gap. It's not quite the same. I like the idea of a parent reception. I think that's great. Totally. And I think that those two ideas can be combined. We know that some have filmed their career panels and then that you can send that to parents. It's also kind of, it builds on itself because you're gonna have different guests at different career panels year after year. And over several years, you might build quite a portfolio where you can, you know, a, a student interested in a very particular career, you've got somebody in the archive, you can share that story with them. Um, I'll also just say quickly that, you know, we've definitely heard that, um, for the students, the younger alum stories are really often more compelling um, and, uh, and, and that could be for parents too. I, I'm not sure about that, but, um, it, whether parents, you know, some parents might prefer to hear from somebody more their own age, but some may be more compelled, you know, in terms of some people think that everything changed in 2008 and, you know, um, and so, uh, whether, whether it really did. And, and so having a more recent alum can be a powerful way to kind of challenge those perceptions of, no, this, this still really works. Um, Great, uh, great question. Thank you for that, Leslie. Um, so so I, I, we have a follow-up on this um, from the Furman University History Department, uh, but I've had more faculty and alumni than students. How do you recruit students to attend these? Uh, Sarah, you wanna say anything about that? Kind of how you got, got students excited about it, made it fun? To attend the career panel? Mm-hmm. Um, I would base, publicize, publicize, publicize. Um, as the as the I was the staff sponsor for the university uh, for the history club, and in that role, I had access to the university's mass email system, um, and so I could log in there and I could craft an email and then blast that out to twenty nine thousand OU students, and I, with the idea of catching not just history majors but all his 
uh, humanities majors, any student who may feel like they're not sure what a career would be for them in their current major. So I would I would do the email blast. I would let, make sure faculty knew about it and that faculty were talking about it in their history classes. Some, some of them would, would then offer extra credit if the students attended the career panel. Um, and it was also really helpful to have faculty attend those panels themselves um, to create further buy-in. Great, thanks. Uh, question for all three of you, how do you get buy-in uh, to your initiatives from research active faculty or do you? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in just because faculty mentoring is part of this and, and there is a little bit of funding for faculty mentors. I think it's $500 per mentor, which is just actually <laughs> um, low compared to how much time they put in. Um, and especially it's a long story, the way we have to pay it out, it winds up being even less than that. Um, and so I think um, I'm really, really, really conscious of this. I think faculty are always eager to work with motivated students. Our, our students are absolutely incredible and they're one of the best parts of working at UIC. Um, and so it's really a privilege to be involved with students who are, um, who are uh, pursuing these projects. Um, so, but I'm really conscious of that, especially because a lot of the research takes place during the summer and without substantial funding for the faculty, that's really a big ask. And so this is part of why we really make a point of scaffolding the summer ourselves. And when I'll, I'll tell the faculty mentors, like, look, we need you to meet with them to be very clear. We need you to meet with the students once a month, here are some samples of contracts. We have a form like with the students filling out goals that they agree to concrete, um, the more concrete the goals are, the better. Um, and, and I think just providing uh, support for mentors, which is one of those things that you realize once you're doing something like this is, wow, everybody across campus, we could use better support for faculty mentors in this sense. We have some of it in the Honors College, which does a great job. But um, you know, this is really an area where uh, I think that support is, is welcome and, and just to take some of the load off the faculty mentor, they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Great. So uh, Sarah or Leslie, you want to weigh in on this? Getting support from uh, research active faculty? I can I can speak a little bit about that, what that looks like, because I was staff at the University of Oklahoma. Um, and I will clarify, I worked for the College of Arts and Sciences, which employs all professional advisors. And so my salary came from them. And I just was a, assigned to the history department as an advisor. I had other majors as well. Um, and so in that role as staff, um, I worked really hard to build faculty buy into the history club because like me, they were skeptical at like when those students came to me, I was skeptical and faculty also had a hard time believing that this was a thing that was popular and attracting a large number of students. And I found the best way to do that was for me to just communicate with them as much as possible about the numbers of students who were showing up to our events and meetings, which they were also always impressed with and working as hard as possible to get faculty to show up for our events so that they could see it firsthand. I, and I feel like once that started happening, the faculty started to understand that this was a, a real growing thing. And they, like Ellen spoke about, you know, especially at a university like OU, um, research faculty might not have a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact with undergraduate students. And this was a way that they could get more plugged in with what was going on with our undergrads. Um, rather than just them being, you know, a, one in a class of 40 that they maybe didn't get to know very well, and maybe they didn't even know that student was a history major, I've heard that happens quite often. Um, this was a way for them to get to know the students, and like Ellen said, once you get in there, you see you're just blown away by how amazing these students are, and it, it improves, I think, their, their uh, job satisfaction, you know, to have that kind of close relationship with impressive, dedicated, um, intelligent, passionate students, you know, it, it, it just makes everybody feel better about what they're doing. Um, but it, you have to, you have to get them to show up to see what's actually taking place. I would agree with everyone's comments. Um, also, I think the gravity of the situation is equally impressive. Um, so in our Dean's office, we've shared the declining numbers with our faculty and we've tried to impress that upon them as well. But we are using a carrot versus a stick type of approach. Um, we are encouraging people and we are trying to reward them for their participation as well. 
Let me, I just want to circle back uh, something Sarah said, made me think again, really this is about, and somebody asked a question, I did peek at the Q&A about how to change faculty attitudes, but you know, changing the paradigm from kind of a mastery of oh, the faculty and, and it's, we've invested so much in our educations and we have to do all the work and we have to tell the students. And I think we're evolving to, to something that's overdue and quite welcome where the students are partners um, in the project and teaching differently and really listening to students um, is actually less work. Um, and if, if, if you can parlay that. So that's one of the things, for example, the Engage Humanities Working Group can look at and work on is how to make that shift and mobilize what the students bring to the classroom and have them be active participants. And again, it takes a little bit of the weight off the faculty member. And I think um, that can't be uh, sort of stated enough. And I think it's, it's a welcome movement generally. Well, great, Thank, thanks to you all. So we have time for kind of uh, maybe one more topic to move on to. There was a number of questions that came in about kind of the politics of collaboration, let's let's say. So there was a question about um, interdisciplinary initiatives and how to kind of uh, handle the sort of turf wars you might experience within the humanities uh, between departments and, and who gets credit for those types of, for that type of work. Um, and then there was, a, there were also questions about um, how STEM and business faculty and programs are responding to these initiatives, especially those that kind of engage them directly and are there opportunities for collaboration? Um, have you run into any issues there, for instance, and in using the kind of data that, that Sarah, that you employed? Um, and then, and there was also, you know, a question about career center. So it's a lot, but you can kind of take your lane there in terms of what you would like to focus on in terms of, uh, you know, where the, where you've kind of found, uh, what, what lessons have you learned about how to collaborate either within the humanities or across campus um, through this work? Um, I'll, I'll start with the collaboration part. Uh, as associate dean, I've spent a lot of time traveling across campus, meeting with people in other departments, uh, meeting with other associate deans and deans, trying to uh, work out arrangements and deals, and then traveling within my own college, meeting with chairpersons and faculty, um, finding like-minded people who are willing to work with each other, and then working on structures to um, enable them to work with each other. At one point, we had a general education requirement which allowed for team teaching. Uh, that's sort of fallen apart. And so now we're working on restructuring that again. Um, and the structures at our university right now don't allow for people to technically team teach um, in a traditional way. So what we have to do is we have to get enough students so that you have the equivalent of two classes and then you can sort of combine them. Um, and so what I've been able to do is find people who are interested in working with each other, uh, giving them support, sometimes economic support, um, and clearly a lot of uh, spiritual support to uh, allow them to then come together, create a class, teach that class, and then move forward. So we give them space in terms of the cap size, we give them space in terms of the room sizes that they need and any other structures that they might need to teach together. Um, we make arrangements with their chairpersons and then we allow them to create these classes. And now we're building programs around those classes as well. And so the medical humanities, for example, works well because it's a department, but it only has one full-time faculty member. Everyone else is interdisciplinary coming from other departments. Um, and it has a, a chairperson and that's it. Um, our women's studies program only has a chairperson, but everyone else is coming from another department. Um, our policy studies program is gonna be the same way. So a lot of our programs are just gonna have a chairperson, but everyone's gonna come from a different department. So the college is working together to share faculty. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, others wanna, Jump in wherever, in terms of uh, either within the humanities or across campus, lessons learned about collaboration, staying out of each other's way. 
Yeah, I, I can just chime in. One of the good things about the EHI is just really making it clear that it's not a degree or certificate program in and of itself. We're not sucking students out of existing majors and minors and programs. Um, but on the, um, on the contrary, right, that, that this is actually allows them, especially our like Hume 202, the one credit where the faculty members and um, people from various programs on campus can come in and talk to the students. But this is sort of a gateway to make students, often students come to campus really unaware of the rich offerings in the humanities, especially in some of the smaller programs. Um, they're, they're, they just don't know that you can major in this or what that would look like. And so really selling it as complementary to those programs, um, asking every single one of the students like, what language are you taking? Hey, did you know you could actually in your fourth year expand this to be a comparative project? You're kidding. Um, you know, you could study abroad in Paris. So really that, that nuts and bolts work with students to really alert them to the opportunities. And then people, of course, come on board when they realize you're there to advertise their programs, not um, compete with them. Yeah. Great. And Sarah, you want to lastly take up this question about uh, the data project you did and how business and STEM kind of responded or did not? Yeah. Know. So um, there are likely people at your institution who do have access to this type of data. It depends what kind of office they may work in. But we had our own data person in the College of Arts and Sciences, and that's who I worked with to access this. Um, and people who have access to that data are trained and are required to take all kinds of training and how to use it ethically and, and safely. Um, and I did not really have any issues with accessing that data or using it in the way that I was using it. Um, just for, for scale, to as an example, to illustrate the situation, um, last I knew at OU, there were probably about 1,500 biology majors, and there's about 170 history majors. And the way often that science curriculums are designed is that students have to make a certain grade to progress beyond a certain point in the major. And honestly, you know, a C student in biology who is not excelling, doesn't love it, and loves history can absolutely become an A student in a history major. And oftentimes, those science faculty, they are, they are aware of that. They know about the problems with that pipeline, that it is an obstacle to graduation for many students. So it's helpful to frame it as this is, the way, this is a way to get these students graduated, rather than having them churning and being stuck and having to take organic chemistry five times they can move forward with their degree paths, get out the door with a degree, um, and, and it's a much more likely path to graduation for students like that. And I have, have not heard anything negative from any STEM or business unit on campus about this work because these are students who are not engaged in those units. They are not thriving in those units. And uh, you know they just need a better home in order to, to graduate and finish that degree. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for these great answers in these great questions. Uh, and uh, I saw a lot of great questions about the particular initiatives. We'll get those answered. Um, so stay tuned for the follow up email. With that, I was also happy to see a lot of community building happening in the chat. Um, and a lot of enthusiasm for humanity, uh, who has made a life size appearance uh, at the National Humanities Conference. So I'll put a plug in for the NHC, you know, come you might get to meet humanity, possibly. Um, so anyway, thanks everyone for being here and, uh, yeah, hope to see you at a future event. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of this and all of your work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.